We got a whole new look happening today. I love this. As, as they set up and get in place, please stand with us, sing with them, support them as they sing out, okay? This will be good.
Oh boy. Okay. very much. Thank you very much. It's a great job. Please be seated. Please be seated. Make yourself comfortable as the praise team works their way down. Look at them working their way up there taking care of everything. Hi. You get that, guys? Look at this. Service. Mother and son team just taking care of me. I'm going to take my mask off for a couple of minutes while I speak to you. Good morning. Hey, so we have a special guest today. Eric Briscoe and his wife Diana here, they're going to be speaking.
speaking. Eric will be speaking today for us, so I'm excited about that. Usually when we have a guest speaker, I, I, I'm, I'm not here, so I get to stay this time. I, I sort of planned this one out a little bit better than usual. But before uh, Eric speaks, I have a couple of slides I wanted to go through because as a church and as a nation, we're starting to loosen up a little bit now, right? I mean, things are getting a little bit more normal. And so I wanted to simply remind us of where we were before the pandemic. Because you might have forgotten, but we were doing a lot of things. We were, we were doing a lot of things. And I want to remind us, because I'll be frank with you, I forgot. I forgot what we were doing. So I just want to bullet through this list of things to put it in your mind, and, and so you'll be thinking of what we would be doing. I just go missionaries. Everyone gets one. Uh, Kathleen was talking about this idea. We want to have every missionary we, we have that we support, we want a member of the church to be in contact with them every single month. We want each one of us to be responsible for a missionary, to report back on them. I think that's the best way to take care of our missionaries. We're going to talk more about that. The facility needs a facelift. You see, our banners are not on the wall now, are they? One of them fell down, and I didn't have time to put it up. So, but we had had a, a, a group of people getting together to look at the facility, right? Well, I want to get back together. Hey, we can meet. We can wear masks, right? This is good. This, we can, this is all doable to see what we're going to do. The website focus group. Our website is our voice to the world. So what I'd like to do is get a good group of us, anywhere from 5 to 50, <laughs> right here. And look at our website right here. Criticize it. Improve it, make it better. Because this is what the world sees when they're not here. That website. Planning events, we started planning some things, so we can't do as many things as we used to right now. But maybe by Christmas we can. Maybe we can think of something we want to do at Christmas that we can do. I don't know, but if we don't, if we don't, if you don't go after something, you can't catch it. Uh, outreach and visiting, there are people that need visits. They need to be there, they need love. People need to be visited and loved. Some of them from in our church, some from outside. So I'll be contacting folks. We had a list of names of people who want to do that. It's important. Uh, uh, community volunteers. Uh, Melissa had already started a couple of volunteer things. They're ongoing. Everyone was super excited about them. It all got shut down. That's okay. We need to remember we were doing these things, and we can do them again. We even started a book club. We were reaching out to the neighbors and to each other. I just want to keep that in mind. We can step up and do these things. The next slide is simple functionality. We have a cleaning crew. We're getting the place dirty again. That's good. People in the building, that's good. We need to have other folks join the cleaning crew. Really want to do that. Multimedia. OK, uh, just so you know, we had a lot of wiring done. There's a TV in the front room now. OK, we had a lot of wiring done yesterday. And the multimedia system was totally messed up this morning. Mark just did magic so that we could see these pictures. You have no, I have no, Mark doesn't even know what he did. He did so much. It was phenomenal. But my point being, not to do that, but to be able to run the soundboard, that's important. Mark and Anne Marie are going to go on vacation in August. Are we going to not let them? I don't know. So that uh, administrative and writing assistance, I need help on writing things and getting them out to people. You know, we all have weaknesses and strengths, right? I got a lot of weaknesses and strengths. Writing is one of mine and administrative. I need help with that. And I'd appreciate it if some folks would step forward and say, Pete, what do you need written? I'll help you with that. Uh, health and safety, we're going to do training. Carrie was going to want to go to CPR, become trainers. I'd like to do it with her. When that opens up, we want to do that because we want all of us to know how to do these things, to take care of one another. Discipleship, if you're not involved in discipleship, we need to get involved in discipleship. Very important. Bake and pray. We had our first cake today. Serena baked a cake. If you didn't have a piece, that's your loss. It's out back. Thank you, Serena. But we need some volunteers and mentors to work with uh, the young ladies and young men. This doesn't need to be just females to have before service to look at the Word of God with our, with our teens that are in there. And the last thing I want to talk about is things looking to imagine. As a church, why couldn't we adopt a homeless family? We're a church. Think of the book of Acts. Why couldn't we be supporting a single parent household for a period of time. I'm serious about this. We need to imagine and think things differently. Why can't we be tutoring students on Saturdays downstairs that need tutoring help? I know Bernadette used to do this. These things we can do. Promote racial equality. What are we going to do to help in this area? Are we going to put an agenda in place to do this? This is, you can imagine us doing these things. 
Rather than sitting back, I just looking forward to say, well, take care of a homeless family. You say, we can't do that. We got money. We could do that, and we could love them. Imagine if every church in America took care of one homeless family. Wow. Think of that. You come up with, I don't know, 30 or 40 grand a year. I don't know what the number would be. And you took care of a homeless family. I'm not saying that's going to be our mission. What else can you imagine that we could do? I just wanted to remind you we had a lot going on before we got shut down, sort of. So we need to stop thinking about, we need to get back in shape, okay? You don't get in shape by running a marathon. Let's go for a one-mile run and get a little bit of shape, get our wind, get it going. But today, Eric's here with us, and, and we got a, Eric's here and stuff, and this is a card that Eric sent out to us. Eric's open-air campaigners. He's on the street. Remember last week I was talking about evangelists? How, you know, it was one of those positions that were in the apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Eric's the evangelist. Remember I said not everyone's gifted to do these different things, okay? I'm not gifted to do certain things. Eric's been gifted to do this. And you can see in his picture there, he's got his mask on. He's on the streets. He's bringing the gospel to people that aren't going to come through these doors. So we're excited. Eric, come on up. Take over the pulpit. We're excited to have you here. Folks, thank you for listening to me for those few minutes. I've got to put my mask back on and let Eric take over. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Rich, Diane and I are glad to be here with you this morning. That picture up there that we saw, the man in the wheelchair, his name is Charlie Blanton. And in 2004, one of the missions teams that we had in Boston uh, spoke to him after an open air meeting. And because of his physical condition, he has had multitudes of well-meaning Christians, I guess, come up and try to heal him and get him up out of his chair. And that sometimes can be devastating because it's just a, uh, uh, when it doesn't happen, what does the person think? Anyway, Charlie came to know the Lord. And I had talked to him before, but in questioning him, he had made a definite profession of faith. So we brought him down to First Baptist in Weymouth, and we baptized him in his wheelchair. <laughs> and um, he goes to Park Street Church now, because he lives in a, in a, sh a home right in downtown Boston area. And we were seeing Amazing Grace that day, because there was no one else downtown. We just went, that picture that was up there, uh, we went down there just to pray at different sites. And Charlie was one of the few people out. It was like a ghost town. It was very eerie. This was in the beginning of May that we started to pray at these spots. Uh, in the back is a copy of our prayer letter over that this COVID period from March, uh, April, May, and June. You'll see pictures that reflect the look of the city and what we've tried to do as evangelists to get the gospel out to the people that are out. And uh, it's been very exciting. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to John chapter 18. This is going to be more of the type of service that I remember as a kid because I want to look at a little segment in the darkest day of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what that day was. It, it started on a Thursday night when he had the Passover supper. Judas left, went out into the Garden of Gethsemane, was arrested, beaten, crucified. That's a 24-hour period. You talk about dark times. I looked at this passage, and I did a devotional for my family when my kids and uh, grandkids, and we all get together for one week in June. And so I've, I've prepared this as a message to encourage us. And all four Gospels give an account of this event of the betrayal. I just want to focus on the betrayal. When you look at that, you're talking about a 15 to maybe 20 minute segment of time that took place, and yet all four gospel writers include details of it, but they have to be joined together to see the full picture. Um, I was 
we used to do a week of evangelism with Lancaster Bible College, and I got down there early one year, went into the library, and I saw a book, 101 Contradictions in the Bible. And so I pulled the book down, and one of the, one of the uh, contradictions was the betrayal. We, whoever put it, said the, they, they looked through one of the gospel writers and said, there's no way Judas could have gotten close enough to kiss like us. Who wants to kiss you with that mask on? <laughs> <laughs> I can't get close enough to my wife to kiss her with that, especially when both of us have them on. <coughs> but when we're in our house, we have them off. So I want to look at that. Let's have a word of prayer together. Lord God, as we look into your word, as we gather here in this building to worship you and to celebrate it, it, it the crucifixion marked 24 hours of really dark demonic activity. Lord, we know this is what you scripted. This is what you wrote. This is what you said would happen. And three days later, the joy that filled the believers' lives, seeing the risen Lord, we, we're here on, a, on the first day of the week to celebrate this. You rose on a Sunday, Lord, and uh, the worship team led us in music to glorify you in this truth. We thank you for giving these young people the ability to lead us all in worship. Lord, now give us an understanding heart and mind concerning this event that we might be encouraged. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, actually, the, the Gospel of Luke ends with this statement concerning the betrayal. Jesus said, this is your hour in the power of darkness. So even Jesus identified it as a very, very dark period as they now arrested him to take him to the various trials that he had. Previous to the betrayal, of course, Peter and John are sent out by Jesus, find a place for the Passover supper. You'll find a place, the guest room, it's, it's called in one of the Gospels, or we refer to it often as the upper room. Go out and find that, make sure everything is set for this last supper, for this Passover supper. They have the Passover supper, and of course, Judas leaves at the end. And you can imagine, I don't, it doesn't say that the disciples picked, it, picked up on it, but Satan was very close to that upper room. He entered Judas as he left to organize the mob that would arrest him. But there's quite a period of time that takes place in that upper room, and John devotes four chapters to their upper room experience. John 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all teaching and praying that takes place in that room while Judas is out organizing the, the crowd, the mob, the group, the multitude, as it's referred to, who will arrest Jesus. While in Gethsemane, before the betrayal takes place, the gospel writers use words like this, that Jesus was sorrowful, he was deeply distressed, his soul was exceedingly sorrowful. Luke says, even to death. Have you ever been that upset that you said, I'm going to die? We face uncertain times. Depression is very high on the list of what people are suffering from. They don't know how to handle life like this. We should not be in that condition. If we can have hope, and you can, when you read through what Jesus does in this situation, you're going to leave here filled with encouragement. Jesus is praying, and he says, 
I am so sorrowful, I'm going to die. Even his physical body. I mean, some of you are involved in the medical situation. Remember what happened to Jesus' uh, uh, sweat? Blood was mixed with it. Your body can go through such trauma that blood starts to come out of your sweat gland. Angels had to come down and minister to him while he was in the garden. And he prayed three times. Remember, Lord, if you can remove this cup. What, what was he talking about, a drink? What cup was he talking about? The cup of suffering that he's about to go through. He prayed it three times, remember? And after he gets through praying, then we have that short period, minutes, definitely less than an hour, that all this would take place in minutes, the betrayal, and that's what I want to look at. So, it starts out with the arrival of the mob, and if you're in Luke 18, you'll see this. Now, there's a question first. You have to ask, how did Judas know Jesus would be in the garden? He left, when he left, they were in the upper room, right? I, I believe that's where Judas and the troops went first to this house. And he was not there. So John gives us a hint. In John 18, 1, it says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, that's the last four chapters of John that, that precede 18, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered, of course, the 11 minus Judas. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So that tells us how he knew. Judas and the 11 were often taken to the garden by Jesus. Luke says he frequently went there. Or he was accustomed to go there. You know what he did? This is the key to get through everything. Do not forsake prayer. Do not forsake the place of prayer. Not just individually. We have a prayer meeting as a church family. Do not let that fall away. Otherwise, the dark hours will swallow you up and spit you out, and you won't know if you're on your head or your feet. I can't be more serious to you as a congregation. I'd say it to any congregation, because prayer is an easy thing to just move off the agenda. And yet, Judas, it's the very key that tips off Judas to go there because he knows the Lord wouldn't forsake this time of prayer because of what's coming up. And so on a personal level, on a church family level, on a married couple level, whatever your group is, children, do not forsake prayer during these times. It shouldn't make a difference what's going on. If you have the habit of prayer, you're going to be there like Jesus is all the time anyway. But now he's got a specific agenda. He's going to be praying, and Judas knew it. And he would take the 11 up. Eight of them would be in a holy huddle praying. He would take Peter, James, and John a little closer. They'd be in a, they were in a little group. And then Jesus even moved himself away from them. He needed to be alone to deal with what was about to come up. And so this is what happened. It's a place of prayer. Now, it says in Matthew this. It says that in, in Matthew's version in 26, 47, 
it just says this. Some of those who stood there, oh, that's 27, I need 26. 26, 47 says, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came. So Jesus has ended his prayer. He is now speaking to the eleven, and the crowd shows up. In, in John 18.3, It says, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. This was no small group. You're talking about hundreds of people that have just entered the Garden of Gethsemane. He wasn't at the house where he had the Passover supper. Judas now leads them. I know where he is. He's probably praying. And this is a large group that come with all this weaponry, soldiers. I mean, you think they're out for the worst criminal that Jerusalem ever produced. And they're showing up here at the garden. And it seems like from Mark's gospel, Judas has taken charge. In verse 48, it says concerning Judas, it says, Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one who sees him. So Jesus is talking with the disciples. Judas has come. He's already given them a tip-off. It's dark. Many of these are Roman soldiers. They don't know who Jesus is. And so he said, I'll identify him for you. I'll go up and give him a kiss. Just take him. And so he's the one they're supposed to seize when Judas is when Judas is going to kiss him. Now, John gives us some very good details on what happens next. This is what I want to call the kiss, when the kiss takes place. In John 18, verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? You see what's happened? Judas has been the one now that's going to let everybody know. But Jesus now comes forward, and he is the one that initiates the conversation. Judas hasn't kissed him yet. Jesus is just taking control. Who are you seeking? Listen, whatever happens, the Lord is on the throne. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. He is in control. Yeah. And Jesus steps forward and basically asks the, the, the multitude that has come, who are you seeking? And this is uh, uh, verse. And then uh, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. This is verse 5 of John 18. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. So Judas is with the group. Of, that are, that are going to take him, but Jesus identifies himself. He's not betrayed by a kiss in that sense. He says, listen, here I am, and then look at what it says next. I am he, and it says they drew back and fell to the ground. What, what happened? I mean, you're talking about hundreds of people. Jesus just says, I am he. What does the group do? 
but wait, <laughs> they fall down. What must that do to that group? Who is this that we've come to arrest? Who are we taking into custody? Who are we going to grab? And he speaks and the whole group just falls down. Now, Peter, James, and John had seen this type of thing recently on the Mount of Transfiguration. When they're with Jesus and God's voice comes out of heaven and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You know what they do? They fall to the ground at the feet of Jesus. The word of God is powerful. Never seek to win an argument or convince people of truth because you're clever. Paul, even, even the Apostle Paul says, I, I, my, my speech is not up to par. But it's the words that come from God when we speak them with compassion have power. And Jesus has just identified himself. They fall down, they fall back. And the mob is now fearful of them. Now, in Matthew, it says, well, actually, let's look at verse 7. He does the same thing again. Now that they've gotten up off the ground, they're probably wondering, what just hit me? <laughs> Where did this come from? And so, you know, maybe the day Jesus is just standing there. He identified himself. I'm he. Boom, they're falling to the ground. They get up, and Jesus repeats himself in verse 7. Then he said, ask them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what takes place next happens kind of quickly. What happened first or second? Judas, it says in Matthew 26, 50, the first part of the verse, it says, but Jesus, okay, uh, verse 49, immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And well, verse 49, let me go back to 49. Immediately, yeah, he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Actually, he makes two statements. He makes two questions. Questions are always a good <coughs> form of communication. When you see things happening that have the potential to unravel the situation you're in. Except this question isn't going to unravel Jesus, it's going to unravel you. Can you imagine Judas coming up to kiss and Jesus says to him, friend, why have you come? What is that going to trigger in Judas's mind? question that reveals the motive of this deception that Judas is about to enter into. Luke also records a statement that says that Jesus said to Judas, Judas, are you portraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You know, when you give a kiss to another individual, that's always a sign of affection, a sign of love, a sign of greeting even. I mean, in, the, in, in Bible times, they would greet one another with a holy kiss. You'll see that statement surface in the New Testament frequently. Judas is questioned twice about what he's up to. Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? What must have that caused Judas to think about? It's always good. You know, all of us have entered into activity that we know 
we shouldn't do. And God will, your conscience, our conscience is intact. And he'll, he'll prick that conscience with something. Do you realize what you're about to do? That's God saying, don't go through with this. Of course, Judas had made this commitment to betray the Son of God. Now, it says in John 18, while this was happening, all this is happening quick, Jesus identifies himself. Judas goes through with his plan anyway to kiss him, even though they all know now who Jesus is. He's identified himself twice. Now it says in John 18, verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. See, this is all happening quick. He gets the kiss. Now he addressed the group again, because they're, what are they going to do? They're going to arrest him. They're going to bind him. They've got weapons. They've got clubs, they've got swords. This is quite a group, but they're fearful of this Jesus because of what just happened to them. They're probably wondering, who in the world is this individual that we're about to arrest? And in John 18, 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. You see the love that Jesus has for his people, for you and me? Even in this darkest hour, they're gonna, he's in control. He says, you, you let these 11 go. Never doubt God's love for you. Even in the dark hours, this is a very dark hour, not just for Jesus, but these disciples are troubled. In the upper room, that's how he starts off one of his messages. Um, John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he continues about his going to be with his father. And so he's showing loving care and concern for these 11 men who have become true believers. Let these men go. Um, verse 9 says that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. That's what this, in Psalm 41, 9, it says, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread and lifted up his heel against me, the Bible says about this event taking place the way Judas would do it. But for the 11, he's wanting them to um, not be harmed in this incident. Now, in Matthew 26, again, this is all happening very quickly. The second half of verse 50, it says, Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. But there's something else that's going to go on now, too. Not only are they coming up to lay hands on Jesus, the disciples are going to decide, no, we're going to lay some hands on you. We tend to think of only Peter being <coughs> the one, but it's very interesting. And this is where Luke gives us a detail that the others don't. In Luke 22, 51, or Luke 22, 49, when those around him saw what was going to happen, meaning the soldiers that have come up, they're going to put their hands on Jesus, right? The 11 are right there with him. They approach to do this. Jesus has identified himself. Judas goes through with his phony kiss. And in Luke 49, it says when, listen to this verse closely. Listen to the pronouns that are being used. 
When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Who's talking? It's not just Peter. They all are some more bold than others. No one's bolder than Peter. Sometimes say Peter gets in trouble, but I'll tell you what, I want, a, I want Peter on my team. <laughs> I want a Peter on my team all the time. Let him get into some trouble. He's going to be much more of a friend than anyone you'll find. And, uh, but all of them wanted to defend the Lord at this time. That's what they said. Shall we strike with the sword? And then verse 50 says, well, now we know who did strike with the sword. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. In the other Gospels, this one is identified as Peter. The Apostle John even identifies the man's name. His name was Malchus. And his right ear was cut off. Maybe he's going for his head. I don't know. But he, he said, we're going to defend you. All 11 are thinking this anyway. Peter is the one that that goes through with the action. And it says in verse 51, now this has to be happening quickly, all this, because not only did that happen, then Jesus answered and said, permit even this, he says to Peter, as well as the other 10. And what did Jesus do? He touched his ear and healed him. I mean, all this is going on in just seconds. But you, you, the Bible is key as far as life situations shouldn't take us by surprise, whether it's what we're going through now or even individual dark hours when something happens. Do not doubt the presence of God. You may say and do the wrong thing. It even happened here with the ones that he loved. But God will restore whatever lapse we may have with an action or with a tongue. God will, God's given you a conscience that will respond to it. Judas didn't. The 11 did. They responded to what God said. And so he said, permit even this. He heals the ear now. Jesus is going to address Peter specifically. And his words are in Matthew. You can imagine all, I mean, there's hundreds of people there. They, they should have had no trouble taking Jesus. But Jesus is handling all this situation. He's in control. You'd think, why are they allowing this all going? They, they pulled out a sword. They struck the high priest's ear. Now Jesus is having a healing service. And um, everybody's watching, all these others, because Jesus has demonstrated his power just by saying, I am he. You know, that's what brings you into the family of God. When you come to the point and you believe that Jesus is truly the son of God, God in the flesh, salvation apart from, from the deity of Jesus Christ is no salvation at all. You must believe that he is he. Because he's a rewarder of those that will seek him. Know that. Be, be confident. Of all the relationships that you have, loving parents, grandparents, siblings, friends, God is in a category where he will stick closer than any of those. Don't doubt his care. Don't doubt his love for you. Now, his response to Peter is interesting. In Matthew 26, he says this in verse 52. But Jesus said to him, referring to Peter, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish 
by the sword. Have you guys seen any violence in the news lately? Unless those people repent that are going about evil, they'll perish in the same way they're trying to gain control. Mark it down. You take authority into your hands to communicate your will and you don't listen to the voice of God and say, God say, no, vengeance is mine. You will perish in the same way that you're seeking to gain control. God's more powerful than any authority. The government can't stop you from worship. If they shut this down, you'll find another place to go. And I hope you do, because it's more important to worship God and do Him. Don't forsake that. The government can exercise a lot of control that seeks to eliminate the authority that is in one place. It's called the throne of God. I think we, I think it was even mentioned up here in one of the songs that you young people sang. God is in control, and He's saying to Peter, "Listen, don't go about." winning the battle the same way they are. They've got all their swords and clubs. That isn't the way you're going to win it. Put that sword up. You, you live that way, you'll die that way. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? You know how many angels that is? More than 12 legions. A legion is 6,000. Multiply that times 12, and you've got 72,000, more than 72,000 angels. <coughs> Jesus could have just, I remember <laughs> Gordon and I were at um, for only a few thousand in Jamaica Plain. Uh, this week I was at Jackson Square, which is the um, tea station that's right in the heart of Jamaica Plain. And we had a guy, kids were gathered on the mat, we had a nice kids meeting going on, and a man came out and started to use racial language against us. He said, you do not want to listen to these men. And he ramped up, ramped up, ramped up. And Gordon and I are looking at each other like, okay, what do we do now? So I remember I did this once before at a meeting. And the person I said it to fled. But this time I was relying, I think, on a saying that I, that I was repeating instead of what God would do. And I looked at the man and I said, in the name of Jesus, you leave. He put his hands on his hips and said, so what's supposed to happen to me now? I'm supposed to leave? <laughs> and Gordon said, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked up and mothers were starting to pop their heads out of the windows. white men in a black neighborhood. All the faces of these mothers popping out of the windows. Then we waited. The cops showed up. Some of those parents called the police. You know what happened? They took away the guy that was causing the problem. Because the parents We're moving in a direction where government wants control over our kids. That isn't the way God designed society. God designed society that the family would be the strong unit of any society. You destroy the family and you're going to destroy society. 
Mums and dads had a thought of your dear children, not governors and mayors and forceful actors. If I wanted right now, I could have over 72,000 angels right here. And trust me, put away that sword. 52, 54, let's see. Verse 54, how then could the scripture be fulfilled that it might happen this way? What scripture is Jesus talking about? You read Isaiah 53. This is a passage that's so clear about what would happen to Jesus, who he was and what would happen, that in the reading of the Old Testament, oftentimes, the Jews would just skip over Isaiah 53. They'd go from Isaiah 52 to 54, because it's so clear that this coming Messiah, it sounds too much like Jesus. I've actually read that to Jewish people out in the street. And they told me, we do not accept the New Testament. I said, I'm not reading the New Testament. I'm reading one of your prophets. His name is Isaiah. <laughs> and they're like, what? Scripture had to be fulfilled. And so Peter, put away your sword. That isn't how you accomplish what I'm going to do. And then John kind of ends with this statement about Jesus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? What's happened just minutes, certainly less than an hour before that statement? Three times, three times, Jesus says, get this cup. Just remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now what's Jesus saying? I'm going to drink this cup. You see what prayer does? If prayer would do this, and it's incomprehensible that Jesus would even think of disobeying his father. But the agony of being separated from his father is what bothered Jesus. Physical pain, everyone goes through it, some to a greater degree than others, but we all live this life enduring so much physical pain, so much emotional pain. The pain that was referred to as that cup of suffering was that Jesus, who enjoyed perfect fellowship with his Father for all eternity, was going to have that broken. But now, having been prepared through prayer, he says, shall I not drink this cup? Because when you drink that cup, that opens the door to heaven for you and I to go in. Because the sin that Jesus would take upon himself, as though he committed it, God would punish it. And now, the barrier that keeps us from getting into the presence of God has been removed we put our trust in his son. And so you see the power of prayer even in the life of the Lord. What happens as you pray, all of a sudden you start to take on the mind of Christ and the issue that you're dealing with, and you start to gain confidence in God's care and concern and love for you. And so he speaks to Peter. Now Jesus is just going to question the multitude. I'm, I'm right at the end here. Matthew 26, 55. Now Jesus has got a word for this mob. He's dealt with Judas. He's dealt with his disciples. Now he's going to speak to this crowd that has come to arrest him. In Matthew 26, 55, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber? With swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. Now he's rebuking the people that are going to arrest him. And all those things were true. They could have easily, but this is 
This is where Luke adds, because this is the power of darkness, the devil and the demons are involved in all of what's going on. And so he rebukes the crowd, and of course, in verse 56, this is when um, what happens here. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled and the disciples were sook and fled. Now the eleven, now they booked. They, they're off somewhere, wherever they went. That's what the scriptures say. You strike the shepherd and the sheep will flee. I, Zechariah 13, 7. Kind of interesting that Peter felt led to put up what he did on the board. Because we're at a time in the church that we are, we should not be in the retreat mode. We shouldn't be running from anybody. Jesus said he'll come, and that's when the retreat comes. It's called a, a rapture. He'll, he'll take us. Right? But right now, we're on the offensive. We have to be. I'm just saying. Now that I'm starting to get out, things are totally different. I've gone to different places. I talked to a Boston police officer. Been on the force, African American police officer. Been on the force for 20 years. He's on his bicycle. We were at Roxbury Crossing. I said, "What do you think about all this?" As I gave him a trap, he said, "Justice has just gone out the window." I had a I had a little track. It, it actually says, Police Lives Matter. And I gave it to him to read. Talked to a guy that had just gotten out of jail. Open to talk about the things of the Lord. Take opportunities as you're out and about. Um... You have a great variety of gospel tracks in your rack out there. Sometimes those can be a window that opens up a door to a conversation. And believe me, they'll 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 have an ear to hear. They'll want they'll want to. Uh, people are wanting answers for what's going on now. And so don't. Give up. We have the message of peace. What is one of the slogans that's out now? No justice, no peace. How many of you have ever heard that in the news? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that came, that came out actually a lot before this when some of the other uh, racial injustices were committed. And it's a very true statement. If evil is not punished, if people who do wrong, whoever they are, if they don't, if they're not punished for their evil, then there'll be no peace because they'll continue to move through society with more boldness to commit greater acts of injustice. See, we have a gospel of peace to give to the world of justice and reconciliation and forgiveness. If you wouldn't mind, in, in closing, turn to Mark's account of this, because he adds something that nobody else adds. It's kind of strange. When I did this to the, my family, they said, what is going on here? Mark chapter 14, Mark adds a couple of verses to end this betrayal. Mark chapter 14, just two verses, 51 and 52, it says this. They've seized him. The disciples have fled in verse 50. And now Mark adds this to his gospel. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him, the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth 
and fled from them naked. Mark's the only one that includes the, this detail. If you look in Peter's gospel, the apostle Peter, he, I mean his letter, his epistle, he claims Mark as a true son in the faith, meaning in the ministry of Peter, Mark, the writer of the gospel of Mark, came to the Lord through his ministry. Peter refers to him as a son in the faith. If you look in the book of Acts, do you remember when Peter was arrested and there was a prayer meeting going on for Peter? And he escaped and then he showed up at this house? He showed up at Mark's house. His wife was married. They're having a prayer meeting for him. That was a house right there in Jerusalem. Most likely, the Passover supper took place in Mary's home. She's the one that had the upper room. So Mark, as a young boy, sees this crowd coming to take Jesus. He probably, I don't know if he was listening to the walls. What's going on in that room? What's he teaching them? Because later, of course, Peter would disciple Mark, and he'd come to Christ through Peter's witness. And so it could have been Mark quickly threw something on and followed this mom. What are they going to do to these guys? And so Mark, because it's in his gospel, this could be. It's not definite. I mean, we don't have much information on this, but if you read it and wonder where is this coming from, that could be the, um, the reason that Mark includes this. Because now he is going to record one of the four Gospels on the life of Christ. So, my beloved brothers here at Calvary, my wife and I are very grateful for the way you care for us through your gifts and prayers. I want you to be encouraged during these days, if this is the darkest hour in human history or the darkest 24, all that took place that resulted in the victory that this church has established to proclaim and to gather, to be fed and worshiped and do a multitude of things, some of them listed on that bullet list the sermon. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, cry out to Him. Trust Him. Young people, don't be satisfied that you, you can get questions right if someone were to ask you. Spend time with the Lord on a personal level so you know He dwells within you. have a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we, we thank you for being able to meet here today and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, for giving us some details about the darkest hour that you faced here on this earth, knowing that your separation from, from your heavenly Father the agony that that would produce also gave you joy because you knew that it would result in many becoming your children, coming into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for so great a salvation. Thank you for such a great gift. And Lord, give this church wisdom and strength as they move forward, as they Seek your will to be done for this church family. Continue uh, as they seek you in prayer. May they see where doors open, where doors close, and know that it is your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you, Eric. You know, I, I like messages like that. They have a lot of little details all across the Bible. I love that. And, but I was still stu I was stuck in the beginning of the message, folks. I had a hard time. I couldn't get out of gear because he got to that prayer in the beginning. Where did, how did G Judas know what Jesus was? I thought that was so cool. He knew he, he'd be in this place of prayer. And I never thought of that. It was just, it was his practice is what it was. And when I looked at that, I kept saying to myself, is that my practice? Would you all find me in a certain place praying? Do you know where I always pray? Do I always pray? I started reflecting on that. How important is that? And, and, and if you have trouble praying and doing that, you know, maybe you should get together with someone during the week, several times a week. There was one point in time, we used to, we used to do a, a Friday night prayer meeting, every Friday night. That's all we did. We didn't, there was no preaching, there's no teaching. We just sat and we prayed. How important was that? The unity that comes from just praying together. It's, it's, it is actually is better than having a fellowship and eating food. Believe me, that, I know that's hard for you to hear me say, but it really was. But uh, uh, thank you, Eric, for that message. That was very encouraging. But I think there's not a lot of us, but we still can take up an offering, don't you think? We can take up an offering. I see Mark's on, Mark's on the move, and, and, and it looks like we have my dynamic duo again. I, I, I got Mark and Serena, but I, I, wanted, I wanted Serena and Sienna. That's what I, that's, you know, I wanted to go with the A team. We'll go with the AC. <laughs> but Mark, would you please pray? Dear Lord, Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the message that you have for us today. Remind us that we think that we're having a rough time now. That time, that those you know, 24 hour period that Jesus had to endure was, was so challenging. And Lord, I, I pray that we can reflect on that, take the strength that we know that God is there to support us in our time, in our darkness. Lord, I, I pray for this offering, Lord. I pray that we're able to use this money wisely to, to share your love for us, for us at Dedham, for us at the state, and for us at Florida. Lord, I ask all this.